Thank you so much. Um, so just before I begin, I do want to say uh, that there are some uh, triggering content warnings for this talk. So um, there's going to be talks uh, talk about uh, medical procedures, um, death, trauma and pain, um, sexual abuse, including rape, um, blood and animal abuse. So um, just do be aware of, of these um, things. Uh, so now if it's okay, um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and start the presentation. Um, okay. Um, so what I want to do is I want to talk about how the Gothic and medical discourse and medicine more broadly intersect and influence each other. So at first it might look as if, you know, the two um, are two completely separate domains, the Gothic dealing with the supernatural and medicine being a science. Um, but I want us to think about how they might come together. There is one kind of primary and primeval concept which informs both of them. And um, if you like to take a few seconds and try to guess what that might be and pop it in the chat, I'm not going to be able to see it now, but it will be interesting during the break and Q&A session to see what people thought that concept that kind of unites them um, might be. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So it's basically death. Um, so Death is kind of a presence and a given both in the Gothic and in medicine. Now it's true that would usually associate medicine with the idea of healing and the very etymology of the word is related to healing, to remedy. But the very idea of healing indicates that something has gone wrong, that something needs to be healed. And very often that threat is in some way or another um, intimated even a very distant even a very distantly by the idea of death um, now of course there are branches of medicine where death and dying are far more prominent uh, than in others think for example you know palliative care as opposed to a gp but the reality remains that much of medicine and much of medical discourse is focused on the idea of healing something which is seen as a deviation, right? Uh, so notice I said um, deviation. Um, and now let's turn to uh, Gothic literature and what we usually associate with Gothic literature. Um, so very often it's been a mechanism of exploring this idea of deviation, especially in a historical context where social norms hindered this kind of exploration. So I'm thinking about sexuality, um, particularly female sexuality in the 19th century, any kind of sexuality that didn't fit into, you know, the social norms of the time. Um, but also beyond this, uh, an exploration and a questioning of just, you know, ethics, theology, epistemology, and what it means to be human. So by tapping into the supernatural, it deviates from the expectations of realist discourse and kind of draws the reader into a world of uncertainty and fear much like the experience of being ill often does. When you're ill, you're often afraid. You're often uncertain about what, what's next, what's coming next. Um, so this is the kind of primary way in which medicine and the Gothic intersect each other. But beyond that, um, they come together on various levels. Um, now, in an introduction to Gothic literature for the British Library, Professor John Bowen points out how the trope of the, sorry, the trope of the strange place is such a fundamental motif in Gothic literature. Uh, so the strange place often materializes as a castle. Think about, um, you know, um, think about Jonathan Harker imprisoned in Dracula's castle in Central Europe, which is construed as a strange space. Um, think about Antonia in the, in the monk imprisoned in the crypt. Um, 
but also sometimes this kind of imprisonment in the strange place uh, takes on the medical form. So if we think about Stoker and the novel Dracula, um, the idea of imprisonment and trappedness in Renfield's case is a medical space. He is trapped in a mental asylum, right? So he's turned into an object in two ways. So on the one hand, he's turned into an object um, by the influence of the Gothic itself, because he's under the Count's influence. He's under the Count's spell. So he doesn't really have a mind of his own anymore. He's lost his autonomy as a person. Um, but he is also trapped by medical discourse itself. So he's imprisoned in, in this mental asylum and he's there not as an individual, but as an object, as a thing to be studied by Dr. Seward for his curiosity and for his scientific research. So um, if we look at one entry uh, in Dr. Seward's diary about Renfield, it reads, and I'm going to quote from um, Dr. Seward, R.M. Renfield, et at, which means uh, at the age of 59, sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. A possibly dangerous man, probably dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is a secure and armor for their phases for themselves. Notice how he mixes the idea of, of medical discourse with just kind of general philosophizing. I continue. What I think of on this point is when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, a cause, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident or a series of accidents can balance it. So there's this kind of weird combination of, of medical jargon and pseudoscientific terms like you know the centripetal force and the centrifugal force he's trying to sound scientific the use of the term man here about renfield is almost is almost ironical because he's no longer a man he's no longer a person he's no longer an individual but he's an object that which he was being analyzed in medical terms the discourse is appropriate to the times and he's broken down essentially into a series of characteristics that are meant to inform, analyze, and basically what it does is it mentally dissects the patient. Um, now, if we look at another entry in Dr. Seward's diary about Renfield, um, he says, the case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man, the man again, but he doesn't treat him like a man. He has certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is, I do not yet know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he's only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment, he did not break out into fury as I expected. So he's already coming with these kind of medical presuppositions about what the mentally ill patient is supposed to do, what he's supposed to be like. But took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and then said, may I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said, uh, that would do. I must watch him. So I must watch him. That's that kind of uh, medical and scientific curiosity. I must watch this object. I must see how it develops. Um, now, notice the use of the words interesting and curious in this um, diary entry. So we're talking about a fictitious doctor in a work of Gothic fiction. 
but how much of this kind of interesting and curious discourse can we see as just you know a kind of intradiegetic mechanism meant to emphasize how strange how weird Ranfield's case is and how much of it actually taps into the reality of medical discourse that's typical in the 19th century um, well, Megan Kennedy points out in a really good book called Revising the Clinic, Vision and Representation in Victorian Medical Narrative and the Novel, that medical discourse has been basically laced with description of the curious and the interesting. With the 19th century focus on the interesting being more or less a refashioning of the previous emphasis on the curious that was going through the 18th century discourse. And as Sarah Wasson mentions, that it retains some of the romantic grotesqueries of earlier Gothic. Um, so basically what Stoke is doing at this stage is not just imagining a fictional doctor. He's not just taking this medical discourse out of nowhere, but he's using a technique which can be described as medical realism. But he does say in a novel, his very premise remains removed from realism, unless you believe in vampires. Um, <laughs> and this technique of medical realism um, is a common thing in, uh, 19, in the 19th century. So um, there is um, a book by Samuel Warren called uh, Passages from the Diary of a Late Physician. Now, if you look at the title itself, it's somewhat ambiguous because it intimates on the one hand, you know, that it could be a real collection of cases, um, the idea of a diary. So this could be a real physician who is writing down his experience of various cases. Um, but in fact, the book is a collection of Gothic short stories um, which are meant to instill fear and horror in the reader through a blend of medicine and Gothic elements. He also kind of brings in metaphysics and theology and all other kinds of things. But primarily, they're grounded in medical discourse. Now, how successfully he does this is up for debate. I mean, some uh, stories are better than others. Um, but it was definitely very popular in Victorian times. Um, so here, once again, um, the narrative employs the technique of medical realism, of scientific plausibility and possibility. And some stories are tested in their approach through a mixture of realistic anchoring and fantasy. So for example, there is a story in this collection called The Spectral Dog. Um, and it's about someone seeing the ghost of a dog. Um, and this character called Dr. Hibbert tells us that, and I quote, um, the age of ghosts and hobgoblins is gone by. So what he's saying is that we live in this era when we no longer believe in those superstitions. You know, we don't believe in ghosts and hobgoblins and all that kind of thing. We're rational people, we're enlightened people. And this is a trope that comes up a lot in Dracula as well. I mean, um, Van Helsing is the one who's trying to convince everyone that, you know, we, we, we are dealing with a real vampire and all the other characters. And no, no, you know, we, we, this is not true. Um, we are so enlightened. We live in the age of scientific progress. How can you be, believe in such superstition? Um, Van Helsing pretty much has to drag the characters to Lucy's grave to see that it's empty. Um, and then they're still like, oh, well, maybe someone robbed the grave. It's, it's not that she actually left. Um, so it takes a lot of convincing these really rational characters that the vampire is real. And this is what uh, Samuel Warren does in this story too. You know, there's, there's no such thing as ghosts and hobgoblins. Um, we live in an enlightened age of medical and scientific progress. Um, so he basically says that the, this ghost dog is a case of optical delusion. So he offers a kind of medical explanation for the sighting. 
but he uses the term a very curious and interesting case of acknowledged optical illusion. So we have the curious and the interesting coming together again in uh, a story which uses medical realism. Now, going back to the idea of imprisonment um, as a trope in medical practice and discourse, um, I want us to think a bit about how illness itself brings about a narrowing of space, right? So think about being in a hospital, think about being in a hospital room, Think about being in a hospital bed. So all this wide space that's usually around us narrows down, it imprisons us. And then by extension, the body itself and the mind can become a prison. Um, now, there is this branch of study called medical phenomenology, which focuses on illness perception and the way in which patient experience patients experience their own body and how this changes as a reaction to illness. And this idea of imprisonment in the body or in the mind uh, is encountered quite a lot in Gothic literature as well. Um, it's particularly common in um, the Southern Gothic genre. Um, and so for example, um, in William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, we have Benji, um, who's an adult character. He's 33 at the moment. And so that's the age when Christ was crucified. So there's that kind of parallel. Um, but he has a child's mind, right? Um, although I try to argue that basically what his narrative offers is not the kind of idiot narrative that it's been dubbed to be, but it's actually a different kind of autistic and sensorially rich epistemology. But that's a different story. <laughs> um, so basically, there are several threats to Benji. And one of them is that he's constantly being threatened um, that he's going to be sent to Jackson, which is a men mental institution. Um, so again, there's the same trope of the mental asylum, like in Dracula. Um, but on the other hand, um, and this is where the narrative gets a bit messy. Uh, so what happens is that Benji is castrated after what is perceived as a sexual assault on a group of schoolgirls. In fact, he was not trying to sexually assault anyone. Um, he was looking for his sister Caddy. Um, and he, because he's nonverbal, he can't communicate. So what he did was he just grabbed one of the girls and this was perceived as sexual assault. And in reaction to this, he gets castrated. So we get this kind of medical punishment um, for this. And this is really problematic because what it does, it, it kind of enforces the idea that um, he remains trapped in his own body um, because basically his masculinity is taken away from him. So what Faulkner does at this stage is he's trying to say that, well, he's got the child's mind and we're going to give him a child's body. And this is very problematic as well because it tends to kind of reinforce um, ideas of, you know, asexuality or lack of sexual activity as being associated with the monstrosity, with fear. Uh, it's infantilizing the asexual individual. So, um, that's quite a problematic thing that comes up in Faulkner. But what he's doing is he's giving Benji a child's body to accompany the child's mind, right? So he remains trapped in that kind of thing. Um, so here the idea is really what Faulkner's trying to do is trying to emphasize the trappedness in the, in the mind and how the body can accompany that. And he does so, as I mentioned, in quite a problematic way. Um, but the trope of being trapped in one's own body uh, is also encountered in vampire narratives, um, especially um, in, if we think about Anne Rice's vampires. And again, here, 
sexuality is quite complicated again, although differently so from Faulkner's case, um, because we get to, um, there's a lot of talk and intimation of sex and sexual desire in the novels. Um, there are characters like Lestat, for example, is bisexual before his uh, transformation. But then there are also scenes where you read them and you think this is sex. But when asked about it, Anne Rice made it crystal clear that the vampires don't have sex, right? So what happens is that the idea of sexual release gets transferred into the first. It gets transferred into the killing. Um, it's particularly interesting if we think about how they can't have that release given that other organs seem to work perfectly, you know. So for example, um, if we think about Maharat, um, she is raped and has her eyes ripped out and then she's imprisoned in a stone coffin and notice here the kind of Shakespearean and Matthew Lewis kind of tropes coming together in a uh, Maharet story um, but then afterwards she is able to take a pair of eyes from a mortal victim and make the eyes work um, similarly, Lestat is able to retrieve an eye that he loses in hell in Mamnock the Devil, and it works. So the emphasis is that it's the sexual ability, it's the sexual release that gets assimilated into the thirst. And this is quite a specific view of the vampire existence in Anne Rice. And we have Claudia, who's trapped in a little girl's body and she really wants to grow up. She wants to be a woman and that desire is explored and she increasingly feels really um, frustrated with the fact that her body is never going to change in any way, that it's never going to grow. Um, she ends up cutting her hair and then her hair grows back immediately and she has a massive fit about it and then decides to kill Lestad because he was the one who did this to her. Um, so we have this idea of trappedness in the vampire body. Um, and um, it's, it's a claustrophobic kind of existence. Um, now I want to mention that for a very long time, that medical phenomenology approach, right, which emphasizes patient experience, for a very long time it's been shunned in favor of what was seen as the more objective and kind of scientific approach to illness and treatment. But recent times have seen an increasing integration of these phenomenological approaches into what's called the biomedical framework. So patient experience of illness has gained increasing prominence in both medical research and clinical studies, but also in approaches to actual treatment. Um, so there is um, a recent study that was published in uh, 2019 that was focused on our perception of emotional states in people who needed non-invasive ventilation for acute respiratory symptoms. Um, now, I know this sounds a bit like COVID-19, but it was uh, just prior to that, so it's not related. Um, what does it mean? It means that basically there were a number of people in the intensive care unit who couldn't breathe on their own, so they needed help breathing. Um, so what was done is they were helped to breathe by non-invasive ventilation which means that oxygen was uh, given to them via a mask that was put on their face and they could breathe with that mask. Um, so far, so good. So um, the, the, the clinical study mentions that prior to the start of the treatment, patients seemed really positive about the whole thing and their emotional states were really stable. If we think about interview with the vampire, uh, when Louis is first presented with the prospect of becoming a vampire, Lestat gives him the choice and Louis says, yes, I want this. He accepts it and he quite, he's quite positive about it. 
and then ends up really regretting it and ends up going trapped in his vampiric existence. In this clinical study, it mentions how this kind of really positive attitude changed dramatically over the course of the treatment. And the people who were going through this treatment experienced altered mental states. They had a lot of anxiety, stress, claustrophobia, and even uh, past traumatic memories that resurfaced and were brought about by the very mechanic ventilation. So what they did is they had a psychologist who'd never met any of the patients before go around the bedsides of these people and interview them. Uh, the interviews were semi-structured, but they followed basically the same pattern for everyone. Um, and one particular um, participant in this study had a really bad experience. And in his interview, um, he talked about how uh, past trauma came back to him. So he said um, it was the second session at that time, the second session that it came back to me. You'll think I'm joking, but that's how it was. When I was 10, I had an operation and they put me to sleep with a mask, a bit like this one. That's when it came back to me because after that operation, once I'd gone home, I couldn't even look at a mask, never again. I really suffered, it was bad, that operation, and it's a long time, two hours. And so at that point, um, the, the psychologist asks him, at what point did you actually remember this experience? And he says, around the second, sec around the second session, it gave me exactly the same feeling. And then the psychologist presses on and says, what, what feeling, what feeling was that? And then he says, the feeling in those days, they tied up your hands and feet. And so I had the feeling that I was trapped. I really felt imprisoned by the thing. And after that, I couldn't face it again. I couldn't go on. So basically, um, also notice how horrible it is that they tied the hands and feet. Um, but also, so he uses this very kind of gothic trope of trapped, imprisoned. And also he refers to that ventilation mask as the thing. He can't even, so the trauma is so strong that he can't even name it. He can't even express what it is. He, he uses the thing it's just to kind of put this kind of psychological distance between himself and that object, right? Um, say so trapped, imprisoned, these are terms used by patients themselves, detailing their own personal experience with kind of medical treatment. Um, now, I think it's positive to note that this kind of medical phenomenology and patient experience has been gaining prominence in uh, medical research and it's being integrated into medical practice. But at the same time, I want to point out, if we think back about Dr. Seward's diary and when he talks about Renfield as, you know, the patient and he kind of mentally dissects him, that some of those tropes, unfortunately, still exist in medical discourse and in clinical studies. Um, so often, if, if you read medical articles, you'll see the patients, this and this, the individuals, um, the subjects of the study. So very, you don't really see the people, you know. Um, so there's this still kind of the, the idea of, of objectifying the, the patient, objectifying this person still kind of persists in medical discourse. It's almost as if upon entering the medical space, the person is reified it becomes a case to be studied, investigated. Um, so this, this account that I've given you, this sounds a lot like what you would potentially read in a work of Gothic literature, right? Um, and Sarah Watson points out um, about how, points out how Gothic literature is preoccupied, if not obsessed with the ailing body. And it's the same ailing body that makes the subject of medical study. Um, 
But we have to think also about the fact that the ailing body is not the same kind of ailing body um, if it's a female body. Um, so if it's a female body, it's often treated very, very differently. Uh, now, if we think again about the Vampire Chronicles and the book, The Vampire Lestat, uh, there is a section where Gabrielle, who's Lestat's mother, uh, talks about her experience of um, being in pain and suffering and childbirth. And I'm going to quote from Gabrielle at this point. So she says, it was, the, it was the same the first time I bore a child. I was in agony for 12 hours and I felt trapped in the pain knowing the only release was the birth or my own death. When it was over, I had your brother Augustine in my arms, but I didn't want anyone else near me. And it wasn't because I blamed them. It was only that I'd suffered like that hour after hour, that I'd gone into the circle of hell and come back out. They hadn't been in the circle of hell and I felt quiet all over. And quiet is an interesting word there. In this common occurrence, this vulgar act of giving birth, I understood the meaning of utter loneliness. See, she's trapped inside her own body. She's trapped inside her own pain. And she compares it to hell. She compares it to damnation. And notice she uses the idea of the circle of hell. And the circle is such a symbol of imprisonment itself because it's enclosed. It kind of goes round and round and you can't step out of it, right? It's also um, associated, roundness is associated with the female body itself. And it's also connected to the idea of cyclical time, uh, which I'll talk about later on in this uh, class. Um, so basically, she's alone in her own pain. It's quiet in her own pain. There's loneliness and there's damnation in her own body. Now, what's really interesting about this is that Lestat is looking at his mom suffering. And what does he do? Um, he describes it. And he talks about how her cheekbones were perfect. Um, they were broadly spaced, but delicate. Delicate, right? Um, her jaw was strong, yet exquisitely feminine, exquisitely feminine. So we have this fetishization of the ailing female body. So this woman's in pain, she's suffering, she's telling you about her experience that was akin to hell. And you're saying, oh, she was exquisitely feminine. Um, you know, um, her blue eyes were fringed with thick ashen lashes. And ashen is also um, a word that comes up so often, both in Gothic literature and in medical discourse. It would be really interesting if someone did a study like to find the percentages because it, it just comes up so much. Um, then she compares her to a little girl, right? Um, and this is like in Dracula when Lucy is emphasized as this kind of innocent girl, right? Um, notice the opposition with Benji, right? He's kind of, the, the, the boyhood is, is kind of presented in a negative light by Faulkner, but the girlhood, the little girl, that's innocent, that's positive. Um, her mouth was sweet, right? Um, her cheeks were very smooth. So we, we have all these elements describing this kind of, you know, stereotypical female beauty, but this woman is ill, she's suffering. And it's almost as if the suffering makes her beautiful. Lestat says, you know, that despite this suffering, she still looked beautiful to me. But then she, he adds, she still was beautiful. So it's not just that she looked beautiful to him, because, you know, She's his mom, so we all see our moms as beautiful. No, it's she was still objectively beautiful. Um, this sounds a lot like when Lucy is described uh, in Dracula looking sweet when she slept, even though she was paler than usual and that she looked a bit haggard. Um, 
So what happens um, is that the ill female body, again, uh, retains very little autonomy of its thing. So on the one hand, it's trapped in its own pain. And as if that wasn't enough, it's also fetishized by the male gaze. Now, in the particular case of Lestat, it's interesting because Anne Rice is a woman. But what she's doing is she's giving you this from the point of view of a male character. Um, and I think she, yeah, she made Like in the, in the 19th century, uh, the medical field was basically dominated by men. Um, and the female body was this kind of weird, uncanny, strange object. Um, and they had an obsession with it. They had an obsession with the uterus. They had an obsession with breasts and just, just the ailing woman. See, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you um, four different um, samples of discourse. Uh, they're all from Victorian times. Two um, of them are fictional, and two of them are from real uh, medical case studies. Uh, I've removed names just so that I don't want to give it away, because what I'd like you to do, if, if you feel like it, is try to guess which one is real and which one's fiction, and you can, if, if you want, you can pop it in the chat. Um, so one of them's taken from um, quite a known work. Um, so let's look at them. So uh, the first uh, sample is uh, at, again, that means at the age of 22, a stout, good-looking woman of lymphatic temperament. Remember how Dr. Seward um, describes Renfield as of sanguine temperament. Um, was delivered after a tedious labor of her first child. The labor was natural and the placenta came away without any difficulty about a quarter of an hour after the birth of the child. As is my usual practice, I made pr pressure with the hand over the region of the uterus and felt it distinctly. There was considerable hemorrhage after the birth of the placenta and much more pain than usual after a first child. The means I took to return the uterus from its inverted state in the vagina to its natural position were, in the first place, by introducing my hand double against a fundus and forcing it gently as high up as possible. And it goes on, but yeah. <laughs> the next one is a shorter extract, uh, which says, on my second visit that evening, I observed her to be more pale than I expected, with a rather quiet and weak pulse. Um, the next one. If I was shocked when I saw her yesterday, I was horrified when I saw her today. She was ghastly, chalkily pale. Um, the red seems to have gone even from her lips and gums, and, her bones, and the bones of her face stood out prominently. And then the final one, she was then about 26 or seven years of age and under all the disadvantageous circumstances in which she was placed, looked at the moment a beautiful woman, sir, with a calm eye and a steady hand commenced the operation. At the instant of the first incision, her whole frame quivered with a convulsive shudder and her cheeks became ashy pale, ashy. And that's, you know, ashy ashen again. Uh, she recovered, however, and under the influence of an opiate, slept for several hours. <sighs> okay, so now let's just rewind. And this one, the first sample, um, now I can't see your guesses, so I'm going to tell you. Um, this one's real. So this one is from a uh, study published in the British Medical Journal uh, about a case of the inversion of the uterus. Um, and notice that this is a real discourse and he mentions that uh, the woman was good looking. Why is this relevant to a medical case? How does this help in any way, right? So again, fetishization. The next one, 
is real and it's actually from exactly the same case as before. The next one, which sounds a lot like the second sample that I've shown you, is fictional and it comes from Dracula. I don't know if people guessed. And then the final one is fiction. Um, and it comes from uh, Samuel Warren's uh, passages from the diary of a late physician. And it's a story called Cancer about a woman who's suffering from breast cancer. And what they do is they perform a mastectomy. Um, and notice again how uh, she looked to be a beautiful woman. And you know, this is fiction, but you can see that it's exactly like the real discourse that was going on at the time. And at some point in that same story, he notes how, oh, it's been, it's been very often observed that it's the most beautiful of women who actually get this disease. I mean, yeah, that's another example of complete fetishization of um, female disease. Um, now I want to just move a bit away from kind of the living body <laughs> and talk a bit about the dead body. Um, now, let's think about the novel Frankenstein. Um, now, if I were to ask, what do you think the sources of fear are in Frankenstein? And this is a question I often kind of have debated in seminars as well. And answers will range from, well, you know, the creature itself is scary to actually Victor is scary. Victor is the actual monster, um, you know, to like all kinds of things. Um, now, it's true that Shelley does employ elements of the grotesque to describe the creature, you know, and she creates a clash between how articulate and intelligent he is and how horrific he looks. So there's that idea of kind of revulsion towards the creature. Um, also, I just want to mention really quickly that uh, the way in which the creature is animated has led to some really interesting scholarship debating whether he can or can't have a soul. And if he can't have a soul, whether he's anima animated by a demonic presence. And there's really interesting demonology studies on this. Um, but anyway, um, there's another source of fear in the novel, and that's medicine itself. How? Well, basically, think about what happens to your body after death. And think about the fact that your body after death can become an object of medical study. Nowadays, this makes perfect sense, right? Like people donate their bodies to science all the time. It's a practice that's known about, it's accepted. Frankenstein was published in 1818. At that time, not so much. This didn't make as much sense as it does today. There was a lot of cultural and religious opposition to this idea. So what Shelley does is not only that she floats around the idea that, you know, after you die, you might end up on the dissection table, but also even worse, you might end up dismembered and some of your body parts aggregated into some kind of monstrous anatomical thing animated by potentially a demonic spirit. So yeah, that would have been scary to people at the time. And it would have been scary also, I mean, th this doesn't come out of nowhere. Uh, it doesn't come out of a cultural vacuum. Shirley engages with some very valid and real fears and concerns that were taking place at the time. Now, um, I want to talk a bit about um, the history of medical practice and the history of anatomy. Now, anatomy has always existed in some form or another. Uh, but basically from ancient times and up until the 16th century, it's just not developed much. And medical practice was not very hands-on. Now in the 16th century, anatomy became more of a thing. Um, famously, the University of Padua set up its first an anatomical theater where people could go and watch dissections. Anyone could go and just watch what was happening. Uh, on open display 
Um, now, by the 18th century, the study of anatomy had grown so much and so considerably, and it was becoming very mainstream. Now, obviously, if this happens and dissection grows a lot and you do more and more dissections, what happens? What do you need? You need the prime material. You need corpses, right? You need corpses to dissect. Um, so what happened in uh, 1751 was uh, that a law was passed, um, often referred to as the Murder Law, as the Murder Act, um, which meant that uh, criminals executed would have their bodies given uh, up for dissection. So it was like a post-mortem punishment. So dissection was something that happened to bad people. So it created this association. If you were a criminal, you'd get executed and then you'd end up on a dissection table. Anyway, this, apart from creating this association, like, you know, this is a bad thing, we shouldn't be doing this, this is bad people. Um, it provided um, anatomy students with some material, um, but still uh, supply can meet demand at all. Um, and as we move towards the 19th century, the demand grew so, so rapidly that it ended up with a lot of um, medical students and anatomists engaging in illegal body trades um, so that they could get their corpses. So body snatching grew completely out of control. People uh, robbing graves and then selling the bodies to um, medical schools for research. Um, and this led to uh, the Anatomy Act in 1832, which basically allowed doctors and teachers and anatomy students to dissect donated bodies. And this was an attempt to kind of try to control this illegal trade in bodies. And one of the most famous cases of this is uh, that of Robert Knox, who was um, a Scottish anatomist, and he was a lecturer in anatomy at Edinburgh. And he basically was allegedly involved with uh, the infamous Burke and Hare murders. So there were these people who would kill people and then sell the bodies to Robert Knox for medical research. Um, so I think that concludes the first part of this class. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen and we can have a bit of a Q&A session and I'll look through um, the chat. <laughs> Cool. So if anyone has any questions, just feel free to write them in the chat or to ask a question as well. We welcome them. <laughs> See, which is the worst. Yeah. Ridiculous. Lestat is so ridiculous in the first book. I think Lestat is also ridiculous in the first book because we get just Louis' perspective as well. Like we don't get any insight into why he's the way he is at all. Dracula. Yeah, loads of people recognize Dracula. Oh yeah, pre-anesthetic. That's a good point. Yep. So this would have been done without anesthesia. And he actually mentions in the story that um, I was hoping she would faint. I was hoping she'd lose consciousness, but she didn't. And she was so admirably, admirably brave and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't want to know why the stat is so ridiculous. I want to imagine he springs into existence as an absolute perfect. <laughs> um, do you see Alex's question a little bit higher up? I think. I don't know if you've already 
have you used critical disability studies um, regarding patient perspectives? Um, I use it in my research, um, but in this particular case, no, in this particular case, it was just uh, interviews. And the, in medical phenomenology, they also use um, this um, questionnaire that I'm going to mention at some point, which is the illness perception questionnaire, um, because they kind of make the difference between um, acute and chronic illness. So they want to understand how patients um, perceive acute illness as well. Um, but I, I do use um, disability studies in my own uh, research, especially I look at neurodiverse experiences and autistic modes of expression. Um, so does that make sense? Mm. Um, Okay. Uh, <laughs> do people have any other questions? Don't be shy, by the way. Um, feel free to ask a question. Any question at all. <laughs> yeah. I've already asked mine this morning for this section, so I can't, I can't grease the wheels of questioning time. That's an interesting point. Um, I wondered if rice as vampires are supposed to have an inability to grow and change mentally as well. Um, I think that's a super interesting question. I think they do change mentally like we see with Claudia, but I also think there is some kind of static dimension as well. I think it's, it's, there's a tension there probably. And I think that's, an issue that would be really interesting to explore. Um, you can. <laughs> I'm glad the cat is watching it. Hi, cat. <laughs> yeah, um, my my little stuffed um, moose. Uh, it's a plush toy. Wanted to attend it, but I didn't want him to because I thought it would be a bit traumatic for him because he's a bit <laughs> young for this. Um, <laughs> um, do, do people have any other questions or comments at all? At the moment maybe. If you do think of a question, if you're still processing and you think of a question as we're going through, do feel free to keep putting them in the chat. We can always scroll back and find them. Um, yeah. I'm curious, like, how many people guessed um, the discourses as well? I mean, yeah, did you, you got all of them right. Okay, that's cool. I think for me, like, the second one felt like it could go either way. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the fourth one as well, it, it so clearly echoed that first discourse. That, but I think I like, sorry. Yeah, I do think a lot of people would look at the final one as a real one because it, it just sounds a lot like the first one. And then the first one you could look at as potentially fictional because he mentions that she's so beautiful, right? And that's, again, such a trope in, in literature and you wonder. Um, I know he's neither a medical scholar nor a literary figure per se, but have you considered Foucault's writing um, on the medical gaze? Um, I've not really used Foucault um, in my studies so far. Um, I've, I've tended to look at, I mean, my perspective has tended to look more at a kind of disability studies approach. And again, as I mentioned, particularly um, autistic modes of expression and also phenomenology, the phenomenology of the body. So, um, yeah, FICO doesn't really come into my research, but I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and I think that's definitely a way of looking at narratives. There was a question just above it as well from Julia. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, the obsession and fetishization of women's suffering. Does that have a longer history than the 19th century examples you discussed? Um, yes, it does, but I think it becomes uh, much more prominent in 19th century. Also, I must mention that my specialism is kind of 19th and 20th century. Uh, it does go back, but it proliferates in the 19th century and it proliferates because um, if we think about medicine prior to the 19th century, it's, it's a thing that we don't really recognize at this point. Now, in Victorian times, they start moving towards a kind of medicine that we know. So they do, like, right now, it sounds all primitive, it sounds all weird, it sounds all grotesque, but they had figured out um, and one of those things that they were exploring was the female body. Um, and because they pretty much, it's, it's complex. So the history of uh, women doctors is complicated, but they were pretty much absent um, from medical practice in the 19th century with, you know, again, I don't want to say it was completely because it's complicated and they were, there was a fight for women's rights. They tried to set up their own medical schools and so on and so forth. Um, but the, the mainstream medical discourse and practice was dominated by men. Um, and then that's when this obsession started to develop a lot. So that's when it proliferated. I don't know. This is just something I was thinking about as you were talking about the suffering female body. And I mean, I'm not the person to ask about this because I'm not an art person, but I wondered if there's a flip actually from a concentration on the suffering male body through the pictures of like St. Sebastian and, and Jesus on the cross. Okay. Yeah. To a flip to kind of this different beautiful death and, and the woman in the 19th century, but I don't know. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because, um, yeah, and it's also kind of when the female body becomes a bit more central um there's i mean there is some discussion of of you know women's rights again women fight for you know being doctors um there's some kind of you know some very kind of proto-feminist things happening in victorian times i mean um that the idea of, of female emancipation comes up in a very very kind of you know small kind of embryonic stage at that point so then the focus kind of goes back to the woman and then there's this kind of tension between the women trying to assert, assert their own ana uh, autonomy not anatomy but, um, but also um, yeah this kind of fetishization that happens because um, the discourse is still dominated by males. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think I think in art it does it does change a lot and it changes a lot, not just the not just in terms of suffering, but if we think about, you know, the pre raphaelites and they they paint these beautiful women, so it's it's the kind of female representation in art. Mm. As opposed to, yeah, as you mentioned, kind of prior focus on the male body. I'm trying to think of this example, I and mean, maybe you would know much better than me. Um, which would maybe be a really interesting moment in perhaps perhaps a shift, but I'm not sure. Um, that was the you know the wax models of the anatomy, and they have like the the female one is very much like a reclining lady that you then take apart and see their like wax, yeah, and stuff. And the male one is much more like it's a, just a man. <laughs> um, but... Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, it was mainly male bodies, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think um, actually even now, even to this point, um, most uh, medical school dissections tend to be male and that's a problem. Uh, not only do they tend to be male, but they tend to be white. Um, and that's, that, that's to this day and that's kind of very problematic so first of all because it assumes that you know the male body is the kind of standard the male the white male body is the standard but also there's been cases where medical students could not recognize um 
diseases in in people of color because they only seen it on white skin. So it's it's extremely harmful, and that's something that's still a problem to this day. Yeah. This is oh. <laughs> Um, should I start the second half and then if people think of questions and comments, you can pop them in the chat and then um, we can go back to them. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen again. And uh, we're going to move on to a uh, discussion of, um, of blood. <laughs> Um, so the blood is the life <laughs> is a massive trope in the novel Dracula, but also in subsequent adaptations of it. Um, the picture here is from the Gary Oldman um, adaptation where he says the blood is the life. And this, um, this sentence, this phrase can be read at like various levels of interpretation. So of course, uh, the primary meaning of this is very literal, like quite literally and quite medically, blood is life. We need blood to live. Human beings need blood to live. Also animals, mammals need blood to live. We need the heart to pump blood through our bodies. Um, the study of blood is known as hematology and it's a fun fundamental branch of medicine. These days, um, it kind of studies diseases of the blood, you know, clotting problems, bone marrow problems, blood cancers, all these things. Uh, but historically speaking, um, it was a completely different thing. Um, we can maybe say that we can pinpoint the beginning of hematology to around 1628, which is when William Harvey dis discovered the circulation of blood. Um, so I've included on the slide uh, a little quote from him, and I'm going to read out a bit, a bit of a longer quote from him for a bit more context. Uh, so he says, it has been shown uh, by reason and experiment that blood by the beat of the ventricles flows through the lungs and heart and is pumped to the whole body. There, it passes through pores in the flesh into the veins through which it returns from the periphery everywhere to the center, from the smaller veins into the larger ones, finally coming to the vena cava and right atrium. This occurs in such an amount with such an outflow through the arteries and such a reflux through the veins that it cannot be supplied by the food consumed. It is also much more than is needed for nutrition. It must therefore be concluded that the blood in the animal body moves around in a circle continuously and that the action or function of the heart is to accomplish this by pumping. This is uh, the only reason for the motion and beat of the heart. So notice he talks about um, food consumed and nutrition. Now, why, why would he bring this up in connection to blood? What, why would food consumed come up? Well, uh, before Harvey and also some of his contemporaries um, believed that blood was basically continuously generated by food consumption. So when food was digested, blood was formed and then it was kind of dissipated throughout the body and used up in the tissues. Um, it was constantly consumed in the peripheries. So like in the, you know, in the hands and the legs, fingers, toes. Um, and it was replenished when people ate again. So it was replenished by ingested food. Um, and the only function of the heart was basically to produce heat, not to pump blood. Um, so we can really see how, you know, this belief links with the idea of the vampire, like, I mean, blood and nutrition, obviously connected. Um, but there's another reason why the association between blood consumption and the idea of life um, is so prominent. Uh, and this, this connection between blood itself and blood consumption and nurturing, 
goes way, way back um, and tends to establish this kind of pervasive association between blood and life. And it goes back to, I wonder if you can guess, um, Jesus, the New Testament. Um, so at the Last Supper, um, so I'm just going to go into a bit of theology here because I think it's really important to draw out some distinctions. Uh, so in the New Testament, Jesus takes the cup and he gives it to the 12 apostles to drink. And he says, take this and drink of it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be given up for you. Now, if you go to a church up to this day, you, you're pretty much guaranteed to hear these words uttered during the service. But how exactly these words are understood and interpreted depends a lot on what kind of church you go to. So, for example, if you go to an Anglican church, and this is a generalization because Anglicanism is kind of a spectrum, um, it's broadly understood uh, that Christ is somehow present in the bread and the wine. We're more interested in the wine now. Um, but this kind of presence is described as pneumatic. Pneumatic means spiritual. Pneuma in Greek is spirit. And also the study of the Holy Spirit is called pneumatology. So it's kind of the Holy Spirit being making Jesus somehow present there. But it's a bit kind of, you know, fuzzy. Um, now, in, in a lot of Protestant churches, uh, this presence is understood to be entirely symbolic. So when you say these words, it's just a memory, like it's, it's, it's in memory of the act. Um, however, in Catholic theology, um, it's taken to be very literal. So the wine actually becomes literally the body, the, the blood of Christ. I, I want to emphasize in the most literal sense, right? This is called the doctrine of transubstantiation. So trans across and substance. So actually becomes blood that you drink at communion. Um, the Eastern Orthodox Church holds the same belief that it's literal, but they don't use the term transubstantiation. Anyway, this is important because if we think about Europe prior to the Reformation, uh, this belief that it's actual blood would have been held pretty much all across Europe, right? Uh, and this would have created an association between blood and life, but not just between blood and life, because that's pretty universal and that's, that goes everywhere and predates the New Testament and is, is, is an element in loads of cultures but more particularly between blood, nutrition, nurturing, and life, between the consumption of blood and life itself, drinking of blood and life. So there's this association between the physicality of blood and its spiritual meaning. And again, like for example, um, some Jehovah's Witnesses uh, to this day uh, refuse blood transfusions due to a very literal interpretation of the biblical verse, quia anima omnis carnis in sanguine est, which means for the life of the flesh is in the blood. So in this case, again, it's very literal and blood is actually made to be the actual physical locus of life. So the blood is the life then. We can see all these kind of levels of signification. It's both medical, it's theological, it's symbolic. But obviously blood is not only life, because if it was just life it wouldn't be that interesting, would it? Um, it's also death. So think about loss of blood. Loss of blood usually is associated with something going wrong. If we see blood, Usually there's a problem, and Julia Kristeva talks about um, the mechanism for the abject being that something that's usually hidden is put on display. And she talks about blood, she talks about menstrual blood as well. Um, also, you know, feces, um, 
intestines, all kinds of things that are usually hidden when they're put on display, that creates the effect of the horror, right? Uh, so when we see blood, that means that usually something's gone wrong. Um, so it's usually associated with some kind of violence and potentially death. If Christ's blood is the life, it's only because, as he said, it will be shed out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the life. It's only the life because it brings about his death. Um, so the life of the blood is in some way consequential upon its shedding, upon suffering. Um, Jeffrey Hill, who a, was a poet who's just recently died, uh, wrote something like, by blood we live, the hot, the cold, to ravage and redeem the world. There is no bloodless myth will hold. And I think this encapsulates this whole idea of kind of blood and violence and nurturing and redeeming and ravishing this continuous cycle of, of redemption and destruction that's associated with blood. And vampire narratives are very often placed within a threshold. Uh, and this threshold often involves a kind of dual take on blood. So there's an interest in blood in its medical sense uh, and also in its symbolic sense. Um, now, um, I want to talk about a really interesting article about, by um, Stefano. Um, he talks about blood as both supernatural and empirical at the same time in vampire narratives and mentions that as we move away from Victorian medicine and into the 20th century, um, increasingly we notice a kind of cross-disciplinary approach to the vampire myth uh, with vampire stories becoming subjected to what John J. Jordan calls the scientification of myth. Now, we already have a bit of this kind of scientification of myth in Dracula. Again, think about that emphasis on, on, on medical realism. Um, but Stephanie traces this development into kind of more contemporary 20th century vampire narratives, very interestingly and notes that there is a preoccupation with the circulation of blood itself, and there's a scientific emphasis on this, and also with the idea of blood transfusions. So um, now I wanna talk a bit about blood transfusions. Um, blood transfusions um, first came about, so it was, it was this guy called um, James Blundell, and he was, um, guess what, an obstetrician. Again, the obsession with the female body, the obsession with the uterus. Um, and he was um, the person who performed the first successful transfusion of human blood. Um, and this was to treat, um, you'll never guess, um, postpartum hemorrhage. Um, so again, the female patient, the ailing female body, and the kind of research interest in it. Uh, he used the patient's husband as a donor for this transfusion. And that's interesting, again, if we think about the novel Dracula and if we think about how um, when Lucy needs transfusions of blood, there's this emphasis on the masculinity of the donors, right? Um, this, this, this kind of the, the man helping this helpless woman. Um, so going back to Blundell, what happened? He managed to extract about four ounces of blood. He used a syringe and he transfused it to the guy's wife. He later went on to perform about 10 uh, transfusions. Uh, now, bear in mind that at that point, obviously they had no uh, concept of you know, blood types, uh, compatibility, RH, or anything like that. Um, so basically, only five of those proved to be successful. Um, but yeah, he also uh, devised um, various instruments for performing blood transfusions um, and kind of proposed how to use them. So he explained, and these are some... Um, 
of his instruments now um i know that some people might be uncomfortable with this and so i'm gonna i'm not gonna leave this slide on for too long i'll just go back to the other one that i wanted to give you a bit of a kind of just glimpse of what it looked like um now stephanie in that article uh, points out uh, very interestingly how Blundell's description of the procedure of the blood transfusion is very much grounded in the tropes of Gothic romanticism. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, if we look at his observation on the transfusions of blood, which was published in The Lancet, which is uh, a medical journal, we can definitely see how this is the case. So, for example, and, and again, this is a medical publication. This is the medical journal, clinical discourse. But he refers to blood as the vital fluid. This is such a strange choice of words, right, again, for a kind of scientific discourse. I mean, imagine going to the doctor nowadays and being told, oh, we'll do some tests on your vital fluid. Ooh. You need vital fluid transfusion. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an odd way of putting it. Um, so also uh, before he actually um, performed this successful transfusion of blood, um, he experimented a lot. Um, now I want, I've, I've included, um, the experiments in in the bibliography but i i want to warn you that it's it's pretty horrific he experimented on dogs and it's not i i wouldn't necessarily recommend reading through i i found it quite hard to get through um but anyway the reason why he starts these experiments it's because he so he's called to a case um of guess what uh, a woman of course who's and uh, he uses the term sinking under uterine hem hemorrhage right um and so he's caught to this patient and unfortunately the patient dies and then afterwards he writes about how he was and i quote reflecting on the melancholy scene for these were circumstances which gave it a peculiar interest I could not forbear considering that the patient might have been saved by transfusion. Um, so at this point, he's thinking, well, I need to do these experiments because I think if I manage to do this, this could save lives. This could, um, this could advance knowledge. This could advance the medical field, right? So he talks about, notice the language of melancholy and peculiar, right? and this kind of thirst for knowledge through medical experimentation. And this again echoes uh, the tropes of Gothic literature. What's really interesting is that Blundell's account of his experiments, experiments was read out in 1818. That's exactly the same year that Frankenstein was published. The novel was published in January and Blundell read out his experiments in February. So this is happening pretty much at the same time. Now, if we think about Victor Frankenstein and James Blundell, they're very similar and the discourses are very similar. Um, upon his departure to Ingolstadt, uh, Frankenstein speaks of his melancholy, he uses the same word, and he only feels better about it at the thought that he's going to acquire knowledge that he's going to, you know, carry out experiments and that he's going to come up with something that will, you know, further medical research. Um, he also, you know, he, he's also quite aware of the complexities of the experiments that he's about to undertake. Um, he says that although I possess, possessed the capacity of bestowing animation, it's not clear how, uh, but anyway, um, he had to prepare a frame for the reception of it uh, with all the intricacies of fibers, muscles, and veins, 
and that remained a work of inconceivable difficulty. And he acknowledges that these experiments are going to be imperfect, they're going to have their imperfections, uh, but ultimately they might end up in advancing knowledge. In a very similar vein, Blundell prefaces that kind of detailing of his experiments with this kind of note that rever reverberates Frankenstein's tone. And he says, so these experiments are now submitted with all their imperfection to the consideration of the society under the hope that they may contribute a little to excite the attention of the medical philosopher and recommend a neglected operation to the experimental investigation, which it seems to deserve. Yeah. Um, so it's almost as if Blundell and Victor Frankenstein speak through the same voice. The, the, the discourses and the approach to what they say, the way they express it, are very similar. And, and I think that's really interesting. Um, now, going back to the Stephanie article, um, it's mentioned that the in Dracula, the scientific nature of blood transfusion is mixed with elements of folklore belief. So for example, we have the garlic and it's unclear why the garlic is there. Um, it doesn't seem to serve any particular purpose. Um, I'd also add that in Dracula, it's very heavily charged with the theological significance of blood drinking. Um, Alison Milbank uh, wrote a book called God in the Gothic. Uh, and she points out that, you know, a lot has been written about the kind of institutional side of ecclesi ecclesiology in Stoker, but not much about the actual physical and theological implications of blood drinking and the kind of blood transfusion that happens between the Count and Mina, uh, which again is this kind of on the one hand, the perversion of the Eucharist, drinking of Christ's blood. Um, but also like a medical transfusion of blood. So it brings together medicine and theology in the Gothic genre. But then as we move away from that and we move into kind of more contemporary narratives, um, Stephanie talks about the film Near Dark and mentions how the scales is now very much tipped in favor of uh, science. And this is where that kind of scientif scientification of myth happens very clearly. Um, because basically what that gives us is a cure for vampirism through the transfusion of blood. Um, there are various takes on this whole kind of relationship between uh, blood transfusion and vampirism. Uh, in Dark Shadows, and um, there's a picture on the slide of Barnabas Collins, um, in Tim Burton's um, version and Dr. Julia Hoffman essentially cure his vampirism by extracting blood from his veins and studying it medically so that she can attempt to find a cure. But what she does instead is transfuse, infuse his blood into her own veins in order to attempt to achieve immortality. Anyway, he finds out and he kills her. Um, <laughs> So um, True Blood as well operates on the same kind of idea of, you know, science and medical study, which can potentially help cure vampirism or at least manage it. Um, so the idea of managing vampirism, it's almost like a chronic illness. That synthetic blood, uh, it, there's a really interesting article in um, the special issue of um, Gothic studies about the diabetic body and the Gothic discourse. Um, and again, this, in, in, in this case, vampirism is kind of managed as if it was a chronic illness. Um, and obviously, now we're not exactly talking about um, medical realism anymore because that synthetic blood doesn't exist. But what it shows us is that vampire narratives move along with the kind of development of medical and scientific research. So basically we're kind of looking at medical plausibility 
right? Because we can imagine if we suspend our disbelief and accept that vampires could exist, we can imagine realistically that this kind of substance could exist. So, um, you know, if you take Jekyll and Hyde, that's not medical realism or plausibility, but this is medical plausibility. Um, but also it's interesting that it's not just um, vampire narratives that assimilate medicine into themselves, but also uh, medicine is, seems to have this kind of obsession with vampirism. There's been loads of inquiries into vampirism itself. Uh, so there's such a thing, there's a phenomenon described as Renfield syndrome, also known as clinical vampirism, that's been discussed in medical circles. Um, it was first coined in 1992 but by uh, Richard Knoll, um, and he argued that it's based, it manifests as an obsession with drinking blood. It starts with um, someone licking their own blood to moving on to drinking blood from live animals to eating animals and to eventually drinking blood from other people. Uh, now whether this syndrome exists as you know a thing in itself is up for debate because usually so first of all it's very rare and secondly it usually occurs as kind of subsumed to diagnostic criteria, which is DSM IVTR. That's basically broadly speaking schizophrenia. Also various paraphilias, but mainly schizophrenia. Uh, but it's interesting that this phenomenon has been actually named after a character in a Gothic um, work of literature. Also, you might have heard about the association between uh, vampirism and porphyria. And many medical scholars uh, try to explain vampirism through the prism of porphyria. So there were papers published in medical and scientific journals uh, in 1964 on porphyria and the etiology of werewolves in the proceedings of uh, the Royal Society of Medicine. Then a biochemist called David Dolphin uh, published uh, Porphyria, Vampires and Werewolves, the Etiology of European Metamorphosis Legends um, for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, now, what porphyria is, um, it's, it's, not one, it's actually not one disease, it's a kind of series of disorders that affects a compound that makes hemoglobin. Um, it can, so it one of the side effects can be anemia, which can make a person look really pale. Um, it also causes uh, photosensitivity, which means that uh, people affected by it, if their skin is exposed to sunlight, it will usually react in rashes. And in more extreme cases, uh, it will, the skin will burst out into blisters upon direct contact with sunlight. In even more extreme cases, it can cause gum recession, so it exposes more of the tooth, which can be seen as kind of, you know, vampiric. And if we think about Dracula, again, that, that's the description of Lucy, that her gums were receding when she was transforming. Um, this is a bit like when they tried to say that epilepsy is demonic possession and that kind of thing. Um, the thing is that um, so first of all, porphyria is a very rare disease and it's so rare and also those very extreme cases are obviously even rarer inside a rare disorder. So we wouldn't really explain the proliferation of vampire sightings. And it's also uh, this kind of medical discourse is really, really harmful because what it does is it essentially demonizes people affected by this disorder. It says, oh, these people are vampires. It can lead to a lot of kind of, you know, it, it, it's othering them. So I think it's just awful medical discourse. And I think uh, that's something worth pointing out and being aware of and kind of, you know, reacting against. Um, but inter medical interest um, in... Um, vampirism goes even further back. Um, and I want to very briefly talk about the Arnold 
Arnold Paul case. Um, I think everyone's familiar with it, but just in case I'll very briefly summarize it. So uh, this is the 1700s uh, in a village in Serbia. A soldier called Arnold Paul um, was reportedly bitten by a vampire and then at some point he dies and he's buried and then people start seeing him around. Um, so they decide that he's a vampire, they decide to dig up his body. Um, about 40 days after he was buried, they dig up his body and find um, that the corpse looks really ruddy and fresh as if it's just recently died. Um, so what do they do? You know, the standard decapitation, stake through the heart, and then burn the body just to be sure. So, okay, so far so good. Then afterwards, more vampires start popping around that village. And, you know, the villagers start panicking and there's this kind of hysteria around it. And eventually it reaches um, the Austro-Hungarian emperor. So what does the Austro-Hungarian emperor do? He orders an inquiry into this case. And who does he send to look into it? Priest? No, a surgeon. So he sends the regimental field surgeon, Johannes Flukinger, to look into these cases of vampirism. And so he goes to this village and he studies what's going on. And this is a doctor, this is a scientist. And what does he say? He says, well, it's real. Yeah, it happened. Basically, Paul attacked not only people, but also cattle and sucked their blood. And then basically vampirism, like an infection, spread out in two ways. One, obviously, poor bit people, but also poor bit cows and people ate beef. So they became vampires like that as well. Um, and he sends this report out. Um, now, um, Mark Collins, Jane Brenzix, uh, and he talks about how, you know, tales of vampires and Strigoi and similar entities were, very, were fairly widespread before, but the reason that this particular report caused such kind of mass hysteria was because it had kind of scientific backing, right? We have this reputable doctor giving it uh, scientific credibility and hence attracting the attention of scholars. It ended up causing, as Jenkins points out, a lot of fierce debate in Germany among academic and medical circles. And so then it gets into Western Europe like that. And it's basically due to this kind of scientific backing. Um, yeah, so at the beginning of the class, I talked a bit about um, imprisonment and spatial narrowing. Now I wanna mention that with the idea of spatial narrowing also comes temporal narrowing or maybe just temporal dis distortion. Now uh, time in Gothic, in Gothic literature is very often depicted as kind of strange, there's clashing temporalities, um, it's ambiguous and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, in Dracula, the geographical uncanniness, you know, the strange space is accompanied by the strange time because the count doesn't just come from, you know, a different place, but he also comes from a different time. He brings, he brings that kind of enchanted past back into the enlightened Victorian present. So it's the threat of the otherness, not only materially, but also temporally. Um, and this creates an element of, of fear. Um, but Michael S. Paulson points out that, you know, Gothic criticism has often approached temporality as this kind of, you know, dual framework involving a tension between the past and the present, with the past haunting the present. And, you know, while that's definitely there, the picture is far, far more complicated than just that. Now, Paulson looks at the mysteries of Udolfo uh, to explore how a different kind of temporal distortion and temporal tension exists within the Gothic and looks specifically at the case of the moment and the day. So he argues that there is an inherent association between the moment and sentimentality. So there is a complexity 
to the moment itself because it's both imminent and enduring. It's defined because it's a moment, but also undefined time because it's associated with sentimentality. So to ye, it can feel like a century, even though it's just a moment. And it's also very much an embodied and sensory experience. So then he goes on to say that it's this kind of fragmentary quality of the moment that undermines the continuity of time in the novel. So he says, and I quote, instead, uh, so continuity, so time is configured as a series of discrete discontinuous presents. So basically we don't have this kind of chronological time moving forward. Instead, it's broken down into its components, which are sewn together in a different kind of present. Um, and so Paulson gives the example of how Ratcliffe uses, um, you know, stretches of, of time, like defined stretches of time uh, to establish it as a continuous flow of exact time kind of stretches such as several days, some weeks, a fortnight, the winter months, two following days, and so on and so forth. Um, now, this is interesting because this kind of chronological time is broken down. Um, and I want to point out, and this is going to entail a certain degree of simplification because otherwise you would never get to the end of it. But there are traditionally two ways of looking at time. One is cyclical and one is linear. Now, cyclical time is usually considered to be pre-modern time and linear time is described as scientific time. So cyclical and pre-modern time is more in tune with nature, right? It's associated with the idea of repeated events and is driven by the natural cycle. Um, to this day, we measure time according to cyclical events as in, you know, the day is the earth going around its axis once and the year is going around the sun once. So we do have this kind of cyclical concept of time and, you know, clock the watch is round. But at the same time in the, in, in you know, contemporary society, post-industrial society in the, you know, disenchanted world, um, the way we primarily perceive time is linear. Um, and this is because um, we see time as irretrievable and irreversible. An event only happens once and then we move on. So an event can't happen twice. The same event can't happen twice. Um, this is, again, I mentioned this is part of the disenchanted world and entails a kind of stepping away from liturgical time because liturgical time is cyclical. When I mentioned that in Catholic theology, it's believed that it's believed that um, the, the wine becomes the blood of Christ. It's also the sacrifice happening again and again and again and again. It's the same sacrifice. It's not just a memory of it. It's the event happening again and again. Um, so this is a kind of cyclical time. So what Ratcliffe does when she kind of, you know, messes with linear chronology, she's teasing linearity. And this is kind of, she's hinting at the idea of, you know, intimating the supernatural. Because, you know, when you mess with time, then we get the kind of cyclical time, we get linearity broken down. But obviously this is just a teasing mechanism because as we know, it turns out that everything actually does have a natural explanation. So it's all kind of confusing. Um, the Sound and the Fury again, um, Faulkner really messes with our temporality there. Um, basically, we only piece the story together through fragments of temporality. The narrative is interspersed with various timelines. First, we have Benji, who has absolutely no understanding or conception of time whatsoever at all. 
And then we move on to Quentin. He's actually quite obsessed with time and his watch becomes a powerful symbol, but his narrative is not more temporarily organized at all because he switches consistently between timelines. So he's talking about what's happening now and then he moves on to what happened at some point without any indication whatsoever. And the narrative is really, really confusing from this point of view. Um, right, so that's obviously a, a kind of a, a thing happening in Gothic literature. But what does this have to do with medicine? Well, let's just think a bit about actually the current situation with COVID-19 and, and lockdown. Um, many people have noted how during lockdown, um, time seems to have completely lost its meaning. Uh, there have been a couple of studies on this, um, and it's been suggested that, you know, because we stopped doing our usual routines, the expectation of what usually happens brings about confusion. Now, um, psychologists have also explained that in times of stress, our sense of time becomes warped. Uh, Nemo points out that we have a kind of biological clock and then there's a biological shift that unsettles that internal clock. Usually that clock would tick at a very regular pace, but when it's upset um, by stress and other disturbances, our inner rhythms become faster. And we no longer have a concept of how much time is passing outside because our sole kind of measure for time is that very kind of inner rhythm. Um, so this biological explanation of the relationship between fear and stress and temporal distortion makes sense. And that definitely is used as a mechanism of creating suspense, not just in Gothic narrative, but also in the horror films, psychological thrillers. It's yeah, that, that's there. Um, but I think there's more to it. Um, I've recently written about how I think that lockdown time also mimics illness time. So illness time is a known phenomenon, which occurs in people suffering from both acute and chronic illness. Um, going back to medical phenomenology, there's been uh, some good work done by Tanya L. Gergel, who writes about who, who writes an article about um, time perception and illness, and she points out that you know um, back in 1996, this uh, patient uh, questionnaire, illness perception questionnaire, was first designed, and it was meant to assess how people react to what's happening to them, um, and. It's standardized and it contains five subscales. And the first subscale was duration. And then this uh, questionnaire has been revised a lot subsequently. Um, and the subscale that was most affected by revisions and amendments was timeline. Um, and basically it ended up being, so there was a cyclical timeline added to accompany the original just acute and chronic distinction. And there were several other kind of repeated adjustments of this timeline. Now, Google says that this suggests that perception of time during illness is very, very significant and also very complex. And it warrants a lot of study and understanding and discussion with the patient. Um, so this also raises the question as to, um, you know, why illness time is so different from what we see as standard time. And here I want to point out again that we have this idea of the collapse into the bodily, right? So we talked about it in connection to imprisonment. But once illness takes over the body, we kind of become much more aware of ourselves as bodily beings and of that bodily cycle. So we no longer measure time in terms of, oh, you know, I have to get up, I have to go to work, I have to catch this particular train, meet that friend at such and such a time. Instead, we think in terms of pain, treatment, management and so on 
So how long has this particular bout of pain lasted? How long has it been since the last bout of pain occurred? How long before I have to take my next dose of medication? How long before I need to, you know, take my insulin? Um, how long was I out during general anesthesia? So basically outward time gradually loses its meaning and is instead replaced by this kind of inwardly dictated time, a kind of bodily cyclical time. What's interesting here, um, uh, what's interesting here is that uh, works of literature that are supposedly not, you know, super, supernatural at all they're not gothic at all they're supposed to be very rational and and very scientific also notice this kind of temporal alteration so one example is thomas mann's novel the magic mountain uh which is basically about a guy who goes to visit his cousin who's suffering from tuberculosis uh in a sanatorium and he ends up catching TB himself. So he's admitted as a patient there, ends up spending years and various things happen and he develops. Um, but when he's first admitted there as a patient, he has to spend a week in bed. And as he's in bed, he's thinking about the passage of time. And he says, and I quote for him, from him, for, for the moment, we need to recall the swift flight of time, even if a quite considerable period of time, which we spend in bed when we are ill. All the days are nothing but the same day repeating itself. Or rather, since it is always the same day, it is incorrect to speak of repetition, a continuous present, an identity, an everlastingness. And an everlastingness and this kind of being trapped again recalls gothic discourse. If we think back to the quote I gave you from uh, Gabrielle and the vampire Lestat at the beginning and how she was trapped in her pain, now if we bring time into it, we get the same idea of the kind of, you know, hour after hour, 12 hours, the circle of hell going round and round and round and this kind of, you know, suffering body that's attuned to the timelessness of its own pain to the continuity of its own pain, to the eternity and everlastingness of its own pain. Um, and that's a bit of a, the, the idea of everlastingness and the everlasting being broken down into fragments uh, is, is a big thing in the Vampire Chronicles. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you two examples. For example, when, um, Louis is talking to um, Armand and they're discussing whether God exists or not. And Armand says, well, if God doesn't exist, then sin doesn't matter. Sin doesn't achieve evil. It's just meaningless. And then Louis quite characteristically says, but no, that's not true. And I quote, because if God doesn't exist, we are the creatures of highest consciousness in the universe. We alone understand the passage of time and the value, the value of every minute of human life. And what constitutes evil, real evil, is the taking of a single human life. Whether a man would have died tomorrow or the day after or eventually, it doesn't matter. Because if God does not exist, this life, every second of it is all we have. So notice the kind of, pay, the kind of you know, opposition between this life the stretch of this life and every second of it. Again, the brokenness into the fragments of time. Um, and in the book, uh, Queen of the Damned, at some point, Kaiman is kind of thinking about his powers and pondering over, you know, loads of things. And at some point he says, um, who in hell was he, the fool of the gods, roaming the road from moment to moment through eternity? So we have from moment to moment through eternity, and we have the longest possible stretch of time, of time that we can imagine, eternity, and the smallest one, the moment. And you jump from the moment to moment through eternity. Um, so, um, 
that's kind of the gist of it. Um, again, this is just an overview because the topic is really, really complex. And I just tried to give you a kind of general introduction. Um, the bibliography is here and uh, I've sent a document that's gonna be uploaded to the website so you can have it. Uh, and um, that's my email address and also my Twitter. So if you wanna write to me, if you, want, if you have any questions, if you want further reading suggestions, wanna talk about anything, do feel free to contact me on Twitter or via email, um, whichever way you prefer. Um, and um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. And um, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, just as fascinating this evening as it was this morning. Um, so thank you very much, Maddie. Madeline. Sorry. Um, so uh, does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Feel free to put them in the chat, or feel free to to ask a video question. Hello. Um, not so much questions as, as points, really. Uh, I was just thinking about Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And uh, in modern times, he would have had to been one hell of an anatomist uh, to suture all together all the nerves, veins, muscles, you know, even, yeah. even the brain, you know, that was entirely impossible. So, yeah, well done to him. Um, also, uh, are you familiar with the um, circumstances of the Raft of the Medusa by Jericho? Painting, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, is anyone else? Yes, no, would you like to hear? Well, well it's well, supposed well, to be same question. Well, it, it's, it's, it's comparable to, um, kind of comparable to Frankenstein and the fact that, you know, the, the, the tragedy happened in 1816. Um, and so Jericho, uh, the government swept the whole thing under the raft. I don't know if you, everyone knows the circumstances of what, what happened with the raft of the Medusa, but the government decided nice. to try to sweep it under the carpet. And so what happened was uh, Jericho said, oh, I'm not gonna let you do this. So he hired a studio across the road from the hospital. And then he bought and acquired severed heads from the guillotine and limbs and various things. And that was in 1818, funnily enough. Yeah. Uh, and uh, friends of his, he used to come by uh, to visit his studio, described it as a uh, charnel house full of rotting, bits of pieces of dead bodies and rats and all the rest of it and it stank like anything and he'd never read Frankenstein it's only just published and it was actual fact kind of um art um life imitating art really is there another point um you need to be quick because yeah yeah I'm gonna be quick okay. yes um so yeah so he submitted that to um the salon of 1819 but uh, yeah, he, uh, he, he bought cadavers and bits of pieces of severed heads and bodies to, uh, to, to study how um, flesh decomposes in preparation for this painting. So I, I, I thought that was an interesting. <laughs> I feel like 1818 is just the year. <laughs> <laughs> All the weirdness. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I want to imagine Tiny Keats digging up bodies at medical school, even though it probably never happened. <laughs> I mean, Frankenstein likely probably, you know, if we suspend our disbelief, he probably actually bought those bodies because how else would you have had so many bodies to kind of dismember and sew together if he didn't buy it off illegal traders? I always imagined him digging it up, no? No? Or digging it up himself, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not really, it's a, it's a very tangentially related question. I'm just sort of interested in your thoughts on it, Madeline, which is connected to Frankenstein. And, you know, you were talking about the female body. And obviously there's this, there's the destruction of the female monster 
Um, but I always found it really jarring because he's making the female monsters. So if he doesn't want them to procreate, why do you think that Mary Shelley sort of doubled down on that? Uh, yeah. What do you think about Mary Shelley's depiction there and her decisions regarding the female monster, I guess, maybe from a medicalized point of view. Um, I'm just interested what you, how you read that. I, I mean, my reading of that tends to be fairly theological rather than medical, because I think what she's doing is kind of looking at this concept of university of being, which comes from Don Scotus and saying this doesn't make sense, uh, because it's kind of mimicking the myth of creation, right? We have Adam and then God makes the partner for Adam. He makes Eve and then to me the failing of making the female creature is kind of like part of the failure of, of playing god on frankenstein's part so i think it's more to do with that necessarily than with the kind of medicalized side of it um obviously there are discussions about how that body would work um how that female body would work and how they would procreate both of them i mean would that female creature be able to have you know a cycle a menstrual cycle to procreate these are issues that aren't addressed and that probably wouldn't i mean it's hard to imagine how that would happen mm. But that goes back as well to the whole question of how you animate it and how you sew together everything. Mm -hmm. But I think I think the failure of, of the creation of the um, of the female monster is basically breaks down the parallel between the the biblical creation story. Mm -hmm. like, you know, you you can't replicate it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you. The question from Caroline about five comments up. Um, have you watched Only Lovers Alive? Yes, vampirism and medicine are closely linked in this movie as well. Vampires can only drink medical grade blood. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's such a good point, and I'd completely forgotten about that. So, yeah, thank you actually for reminding me. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I think I'm actually probably going to watch it tonight. Um, I've got to shake my loaves of sourdough. <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, I think the idea was to make legal ways for anatomists to get bodies if they did not get them legally, then via resurrection men, and then were many unscrupulous sexes and even clergy who sold bodies yeah there was there was such a the body trade was completely out of control so yeah the idea was to put a stop to that and to make it possible you know the, for people to carry out dissections and put an end to that um series of yeah because because it, it did end up like people ended up murdering uh, people specifically so that they could sell their bodies so it's completely out of control um yeah um let me just scroll through if people don't have any major questions at the moment i will say thank you again to madeline and stop the recording <laughs>